Welcome for this uh, second uh, session. Uh, I, it would be my pleasure to introduce uh, uh, Oyel uh, Quesada, uh, which is the Dean of Bath Provost. And the, and the Academy by Provost. <laughs> so uh, he will introduce his fabulous colleagues to us, and then we're going to have uh, their presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Uriel Quesada. Um, I'm the academic by provost at Loyola University in New Orleans. Um, I'm very glad to introduce this first panel. Uh, the session title is Facing Disaster in a Coastal City, Scholarship Service Learning and Holistic Community Engagement. And the title of the panel is Addressing Environmental Issues, Racial Inequality inequities and injustices in New Orleans during the COVID-19 pandemic. So we have three panelists. We have uh, Dr. Amy Thomas, who is assistant professor in the Department of Biological Sciences and director of the Inter Interdisciplinary Environmental Studies Program at Loyola University in New Orleans. Dr. Thomas is a very well-known uh, scholar and activist. Um, she is also well known for her work with um, uh, um, spider communities in different parts of the world, including Belize, of course, uh, New Orleans, and uh, Jean Lafitte National Park. She is uh, a great student mentor. And she is currently uh, working on a project uh, entitled Transforming a Public Work into a Learning Lab, where they are studying ways to empower New Orleans to sustainable life with water. Today, she will focus on a course she developed through part of that project. With Dr. Thomas, we have Hilary Duyen, who is a junior with a double major in theater arts and environmental science with a concentration in biological sciences. They have an interest in textiles as well as the slow fashion movement. Hillary also has a passion for working with the community such as the community garden to be studied at Loyola University in New Orleans through the Mission in Inter in Integrant Grant, M-I-G-S grant they successfully wrote with professors. M. Berlin Heisen is a senior majoring in environmental studies with a concentration in social sciences. I'm minoring in Spanish. She's currently conducting research with Dr. Thomas on community by M with innovative stormwater management practices. Last week, Berlin presented her research in the mentored undergraduate research poster competition at the annual professional development conference of the National Association of Biology Teachers in Atlanta, Georgia. Her presentation earned first place among the college students who conducted research in their discipline. Berlin is also serving on the Dean's Student Advisory Council as a representative for the Environment Program and is the secretary of the SEA Student for Environmental Action, a student-led group that focuses on sustainability education and advocacy, both on and off campus. Well, with all of you, our panelists, thank you. Okay, everyone, um, thank you so much for joining us um, in person and also virtually. Um, thanks, Dr. Kuti, for inviting us to this amazing event where we are learning from other scholars and learning about ideas and ways in which you're making a difference um, in the path of these disasters that um, the theme will continue about Gulf Coast from the, the previous speakers. So that's, that's, so that's exciting. Um, I'm also excited to be here with um, two of our star students that are gonna uh, co-present on this panel based on the work that they have done as scholars, as students, um, on campus, off campus, uh, in classrooms, outside of classrooms, in labs, in the field, all over the place. Our students do a whole lot. We're, we're primarily undergraduate institution. And so the research that I conduct is always with undergraduate students. 
And so I usually treat them as graduate students and they act like graduate students. And so their work is often uh, rivaled by some, some master's projects. So um, that, that's very exciting to me as a scholar and hopefully um, you know, show them off to you today. So Dr. Casada um, has been my associate dean, my dean, and now my vice provost. And so he is who got us connected with um, this conference today. And so um, when we found out about it about two years ago, we started thinking about what it is that we wanted to talk about and bring in our research um, to discuss with others and, and just get feedback, find out what you're talking about, uh, tell you what we're doing, see if you can give us ideas, collaborations, things like that. And so um, we're always open to collaborative projects uh, to expand our reach and what we learn um, and expand our knowledge as well. And so um, I also have two other colleagues who will be presenting this afternoon in the part two of Facing Disasters in uh, Coastal City. And they're, we're all gonna talk about our scholarship, our service learning and our essentially holistic community engagement approach to the work that we do. And you'll see that we're all very different in what we do. Um, I'm actually a scientist, I'm a biologist and my primary work as Dr. Posada said is on natural history of um, invertebrate communities, specifically spiders. And so the work that I'm doing uh, that I'm presenting today steps outside of that comfort zone and so I've been working on this project for about three or four years now and it's uh it's exciting stuff definitely something that's important to talk about and it affects my spiders so you know it's it's I want to tell others about it as well specifically our panel uh Verlene and Hiller and I are going to focus on uh the title that's right here and so we want to tell you some of the ways in which we are addressing um, environmental issues, racial inequities, and injustices in New Orleans, and especially during the COVID pandemic, uh, so COVID-19 pandemic, and um, that is ongoing, of course. But one of the things that um, I want to just give you some backstory on, if um, I don't know if y'all are, are uh, readers of Malcolm Gladwell's Tipping Point and other works where he is his podcast now, Revisionist History, and and things like that, but he, I like his reading because it's outside of the sciences and it helps me think in a different way. And another reason I like to be around scholars outside of the, the sciences because, the natural sciences, because it helps me understand things in a little different way. But one of the things that really resonated with me and as I've been thinking over the past two years since March, 2020, is about the tipping point or what I consider to be a major tipping point um, not only on college campuses, but across our country. And um, if you think about it and think about how it fits in with the path of disasters, um, I would have never thought I'd be presenting on this at, at a conference like this. Um, but really summer 2020 was a time of, um, you know, think of it as like dueling crises in higher education. And since all of you are affiliated with higher education, you, I'm sure, have some similar thoughts um, about this. But the COVID-19 pandemic was forcing us as faculty, as scholars, as colleagues, as um, administrators to reimagine, of course, the delivery method, which we all learned Zoom, and so there's a lot of positives that have come out of that. Um, but how are we going to deliver our courses to where they're going to be engaging, they're going to be challenging, they're going to still get our students to learn in the way that we want them to learn, and um, and involve them the way that we do when we are face to face. And so, you know, how, what are these delivery methods of these courses? How are we going to challenge um, these to support our students and, and deal with the grief, with the loss of loved ones, with the unknowns, all the unknowns um, that now we, we have a lot more understanding, but at this time in summer of 2020, we didn't. Um, what are the economic prospects, uh, important milestones? graduations, proms for the high school kids that are students that are now sophomores, um, you know, just all the, the things that, that they missed. And on top of all of that, all of the civil injustices that were happening around our country that have happened, but the tipping point, I believe, was George Floyd and everything surrounding that. Um, incidences of violence, discrimination, unequal opportunity mobilized, um, our students and students around the country and people in general to articulate 
um, the, uh, the painful experiences, these microaggressions, if you want to call them, um, and discrimination everywhere, but specifically our focus, of course, is on our college students and, and college campuses. So student leaders really began to press, and, um, and that's usually, as y'all know, how things get done a lot of times on college campuses is uh, based on the students and, and what they're pressing. So um, our uh, administrators started rethinking our curriculum and what we can do to be more inclusive in a lot of ways. And so at uh, Loyola University, I, I put part of our mission up there uh, for y'all to see, um, and I'll just read it to you. It's um, it, our mission includes welcoming students of diverse backgrounds, preparing them to lead meaningful lives with and for others. And so we think about that all the time, but really we're thinking about it from a different perspective in that summer of 2020 and of course continuing now. Addressing, um, how do we address these uh, challenges creatively? How do we make um, use of this tipping point that's happening? And so our administrators came up with this idea, since we're all at home, we're all quarantined, but we don't want to lose a semester of education, we don't want to lose time, what can we do to embrace what we're all feeling and, and really learn from it? And so um, our, our admins came up with this idea of a two-week January uh, term course that is um, that really focus on addressing some of these social crises. Um, and yep, thank you. Got it. Um, this is a, a, a heavy content here, but I, I thought it was important to show you all this because we're thinking of addressing this um, newly instituted what we're calling a J term. And y'all might already have this January term. We never had it worked into our semester where we could do a two week short course um, term for students to catch up, to get ahead, um, and, and just talk about things that we might not otherwise get to during the semester. And so, um, you know, we've got this, these are the disasters. We've got a health crisis. We've got a, a social crisis. We've got, um, you know, people that were having to you know do things in a different way child care all the other things that you can you know bring up from your your experiences and so we were invited to propose some innovative courses short courses that focused on diversity equity and inclusion and um, they told us we'll give you a, a preference if there's some kind of community engagement figure it out essentially you know let's let's see how we can engage our community even though we're all quarantined at this time so um to tie in with what uh, Dr. Blackburn was talking about with uh, the coast, that's a lot of what we're doing now is thinking about uh, my research and, and some of my colleagues is thinking about um, our coastline. Well, we've been thinking about it, but really studying, digging in deep. And so um, we had just had a fall semester in 2020 that you saw the data already. So I don't even have to bring it up again. You saw the, all the hurricanes, you know, we had those five events that affected our Gulf Coast. And so um, one of the things that I thought about was, well, we've got this unprecedented health crisis, all these storms, our coastline, social unrest, injustices, all the things I've been mentioning kind of coming together. And so um, I thought we need to address all of these things and get our students thinking about these things, even if they're from Mobile and Los Angeles and other places. And so what I came up with was this um, course that focused on um, how the work I do in the environmental sciences has led to some of these injustices, these inequities, and um, and these you know diversity issues in and using New Orleans as our as our case study. And so um, I thought, well, there's no way I can do this alone. And let's just be honest. Here I am, a white woman. What am I going to talk about with you know talking about BIPOC? Which I, I wanted to make sure you know we have forty percent. Is that the right number now? Uh, minority students at Loyola, it's 20 something percent Hispanic. It's 48%. 48%. Okay, so our mission, we actually, you know, it's not just part of our mission, we actually, you know, specifically address and try to recruit students um, of, from minority backgrounds. So all of this is going around in my head like a hurricane, you know, like what do we do with this? So I, um, I approached one of my colleagues who you see um, in the, she's in the middle, yeah, Mary Ecafone, who's an environmental lawyer and teaches at our law school um, at Loyola, who um, does really amazing things and is really in the sector of what Blackburn was talking about with 
she still practices law and still gets her students involved with law. You know, what can we do? She also has a nonprofit as well where they're feeding people. So all these things, I thought she's perfect. And then um, my colleague, Phil, does, uh, well, he's just got tons of energy. And uh, so I thought, well, come help me teach some of these environmental um, aspects and let, let's just team teach this and, and see what, what happens. And so uh, we came up with this um, whole scenario of, you know, what, what are the, the things that we do and the environment does that affect some of these communities and particularly those identified as, as BIPOC, you know, so the black indigenous people of color um, and or low income in, in New Orleans. So hopefully you know a little bit about New Orleans, maybe a little bit about our culture. We are, um, we are a pluralistic society. We have people that have um, come from lots of different backgrounds and, and experiences. Uh, that have formed the melting pot that is New Orleans. It's one of the reasons that I love being there. It's one of the things that excites us. It contributes to our food. It contributes to our music. It contributes to lots of different things. Uh, it's an interesting city. If you haven't ever been, please go. It's a great place to go and to learn about people. Um, but citizens face significant challenges on a daily basis that involve environmental issues and how they have had um, an impact on current situations involving equity, involving inclusion, um, involving you know our justice system tr in transportation, in health. And so that's kind of the story that I like to tell because that's the research that I do. Um, and, and so the, the justice from a policy perspective is what Marianne Cafone brought to the table and then Phil, like I mentioned, a colleague, um, he does a lot of work in the field to bring in um, ways of thinking about the environment in, in a, from a different perspective. I mean, he studies algae. And um, so thinking of things in a little bit different way. So all of that together, that's a, a lot of verbiage there to kind of set the stage for, for what we've done. But I think it's important because this, because of the connection with where we live, and what we have done um, over time. So just a little bit more of the backstory. We are a city that, uh, New Orleans is a city that just celebrated a few years ago, 300 years. So established by French um, settlers, um, Spaniards have had influence there. Um, obviously there's uh, it, you know influence from the uh, slave trade, so African influence. Um, and, and all the things that bring our culture together, which is so interesting in and of itself, but I don't have time to go into all that today, but there's a lot of, a lot written on that, that I think is interesting. So hopefully you, um, will go and learn about it, but our Mississippi river Delta Southeast Louisiana ha was formed over about 6,000 years of Blackburn. I think said it earlier about the water's going to go where the water's going to go. Water takes the path of least resistance. So over about 6,000 years, as the Delta was forming the land that we are on, um, you know, it, it, it's a young land. Um, and so even though there are issues with water in Nevada, there are issues with water in all place, you know, uh, Houston, in New Orleans, it's all based on different reasons. And so this, um, our Southeastern Louisiana, Mississippi River uh, Delta that you're seeing in that picture right there is, um, is a great photo to show our proximity to the coast from the east, from the south, um, and then also the other bodies of water that's at the very top right there, that's Lake Pontchartrain. So everything with the way in which our land has formed has helped us to uh, really grasp and um, understand why we have situations like we have right now with unintended consequences, as I like to call them, of water issues. And of course, with climate change, all of that is, um, is happening at a, a much faster rate as well. So just a little more background about that. Historically, we get about 64 inches of rain a year. This year, we reached that by June, by summer. Um, if we reached 64 inches, that's on average. So we have flooding events that aren't even tied to 
hurricanes. We have flooding events that aren't even tied to um, major storms like um, cold fronts and, and so forth moving through. Uh, but we've managed to live there for 300 years. So people in New Orleans are resilient, we're creative, we've figured out things. And so um, if you study a little bit more about the way in which we've managed to do that, you start learning about what the Corps of Engineers has done to help us um, reinforce and establish levee systems. Natural levee is great, but reinforce it um, to make it better, add spillways to divert waters um, in the, you know, the Mississippi River drains 40% of our country, and that comes right by our city. So when there are really big um, snow, snow years and um, major storms in the spring, all that water that's coming from Iowa and other places up in the um, in the parts of the country that that drain into that basin come right by us. So the world has flooded over and over and over again. So we have since building just in creating these levees, we have all this um, underground gray infrastructure that is of course now aging. All these pipes, if you haven't been to New Orleans lately, just prepare for construction everywhere. You're either gonna be on a street that's like this because of the uh, way in which our, our land is sinking, the subsidence that you see in that, that picture right there, that's in my neighborhood, um, or it's dug up because they're trying to fix the, you know, the pipes that are leaking and, the, the, and crumbling underneath us. And of course, Katrina uh, exposed all of these things, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so there's a whole lot to talk about with that. That's kind of the cliff note version of the environmental influence on our region, the unattended consequences like subsidence, the sinking um, that has occurred the unintended consequence of having this innovative at the time drainage system in the early 1900s that has not been updated. And in fact, when we visited one of our pumping stations that pumps all of uptown New Orleans this summer, we realized they keep a log of everything they do on paper in the pumping station. Doesn't make much sense. So um, fingers crossed with the um, infrastructure bill that just passed. Hopefully, uh, some of these things will be addressed in New Orleans and used in, in other places. So, all of this is a background to help you understand kind of the approach that we were taking to this course and my approach of let's understand why the land is lower in some of these neighborhoods and why that land being lower would have led to cheaper um, uh, real estate and cheaper real estate affordable by, you know, a hundred years ago, the immigrants or those that were forced into New Orleans and were now freed and able to buy their own land. Um, and, you know, where are you going to be able to afford these things? So it's not, um, it, 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 the challenge is, is that we, if we think from a land perspective, it makes total perfect sense why the richest people and the largest homes occur along St. Charles Avenue, which is what we call the sliver by the river. It's the highest land. It was the first to be established because it was the highest land. And who is gonna be, who are the people who will take the best land um, historically and continuing today. So all of these things, if you haven't ever thought about the so social implications of why low socioeconomics are positioned here and why this area was the area that flooded with the break of the levees and why it continues to today. And so we wanted to expose and read more ourselves, but expose our students to all these things. So I've talked a lot and I want you to hear from my students because I think they're amazing. Um, and they can tell you some of the experiences and, and what we did to make this work in a creative fashion. And really, um, so that was almost a year ago, what resonated with them um, that they still think about today. And so I will turn it over to our stars. Uh, hi everyone, I'm Hillary Wynn. I'm very 
grateful to be here today. Thank you to Loyola and Dr. Thomas for bringing me, but also thank you to Rice for having us today. We're really appreciative of this opportunity to talk to you guys and to talk about our shared experiences um, across the U.S. So over the J term, we were able to talk to various groups of people, various organizations about what they were doing to create solutions, um, study solutions to the issues that we, um, that do occur in New Orleans. And so one of those opportunities that we had was to talk to the chiefs of the Ile de Jean Charles band of the Biloxi Chittimacha Choctaw tribe who live, um, who currently are located in Puma, which is uh, a little south of New Orleans in the subsidiaries. Um, so we started with doing prior research to gain more knowledge about the tribe and about the troubles that their ancestors have had and the troubles that they currently struggle with and what they're trying to overcome and people trying to help them overcome these issues. Um, we then were lucky enough to be able to talk to the chiefs of these tribes, Chief Albert Naquin, as well as Chief Sherelle Parfait Dardar, um, and someone not pictured, um, environmental science teacher Nathan Jesse at Tulane University um, on a Zoom panel. And uh, Professor Nathan Jesse acts as a liaison of sorts between the tribe and the local government, as well as other groups in the community to raise awareness for their cause, as well as raise funding and um, talk about policies that would help them better their situation. Um, so first I'd like to start off that I think that this is a very prime example of how environmental racism is such, um, has had such detrimental uh, effects on a certain group of people. Um, this, the uh, Biloxi Chinamacha Chaka tribe were first relocated to Puma in the 1830s due to the Indian Removal Act as well as many other tribes um, being relocated elsewhere across the entire nation. They were then um, in Huma, they then settled there and made that their home and they have lived there um, for about two centuries now and they've had their rituals there, their ceremonies there, they have made that their home. Um, and now they are about to be moved yet again um, due to the Louisiana Strategic and Adaptations for Future Environments program that was started in 2019. Um, they are now known as the first climate refugees in the United States of America. They are being moved because they no longer have a home. This is due to various reasons. This is due to sea level rise, subsidence. They have had a 98% land loss in Puma, um, as well as um, another reason it would be development, pipeline development in the Gulf um, is only growing and growing. And so they need to get these people out so they can move other people in, frankly. Um, and so we were lucky enough to talk to these um, chiefs and talk to them about their experience, the experiences that they, and how they felt with their family members leaving the area in order to just have a home. Their family members had to leave Puma, they had to leave their ancestral lands <clears throat> simply because they lost everything, they didn't have a home. It was just better than nothing, frankly. Um, and these chiefs are still located there. They're still located down in Puma and they are fighting for their cause. They are fighting to get this land back. They're fighting to use the funding that they got through the LA Safe program to better their current situation instead of just giving up and starting over yet again, uh, frankly. And so with little to no representation in the local government, they do have little say about what can be done. And so what we tried to do um, as a Jan term was just simply raise awareness to, about what we could do in order to help them, whether that be to simply talk about their cause with you guys or um, to talk to the local government um, at, other, at various councils. 
um, and things like that. And there are many ways that other people can help as well, whether that be to um, learn more about the traditional ecological knowledge that they have and how to better the environment, um, or to fight for them to get represented. Um, and I'd like to end um, my little part here about also bringing up that they were also highly affected during Hurricane Ida. Um, that recently happened. We were all affected by Hurricane Ida down in New Orleans, but we they got, um, a, it was a lot, lot worse down in Huma than it was for us um, up in the city. And so they got little to no media coverage, little to no funding, little to no resources. And they're still fighting today to just get everything back um, with all of the troubles that they've gone through on top of Ida right now as well. Thank you. Hi everyone, I'm Gregory Einstein, and um, one of the topics that stood out to me most about our Jason course was that of in, uh, food insecurity. And um, according to a 2010 survey, more than 50 million um, Americans got access to um, healthy food and this has increased over the decade and there has been a significant increase over the pandemic. And um, New Mexico is the biggest um, recipient of food support in the nation and that is mainly due to that being, um, to having a large indigenous population, which are, which come from low income backgrounds and New Orleans is the same. And um, so while um, low income people can receive food stamps, this is a very cumbersome process and is very invasive as well. You really have to provide all the documents and um, kind of just really expose all your financial issues so the government can really trust you and believe that you are, I guess, deserving of um, these food stamps. And, um, and while many of these, person, um, these citizens can get food stamps, that is not enough for the average family. And so um, these people will rely on food banks. Um, and food banks are typically open from eight to four or nine to five, so like a typical work day. But um, oftentimes those um, relying on food banks work during these times. And so they, they don't have the luxury to wait in line, especially in the morning when um, the best options are there. And so they're left just running on, from their way to work or um, hoping they could go early in the morning to get um, the food they want. And um, usually there's not much left over. And um, for those who do get the best bag from the food bank, they typically wait two or three hours before the food bank even open. And even then, they don't even receive enough food for their family. And, um, over the Jake's turn, um, our class, we visited um, Second Harvest Food Bank, which is the largest food bank in, um, south, in southern Louisiana. And their mission is to um, provide food to those who, can't have, um, who don't have access to it, as well as advocate for those um, who are in need of food, and as well as um, educate the public and ways they could, um, they could aid to this um, issue also just explain how food insecurity comes about and not, uh, and not um, like, yeah, it's not it, how food insecurity comes about. And um, unfortunately, food is seen as both a solution and a problem. And so in New Orleans, there are only 31 full service grocery stores, um, which consists, which means that um, they, they provide fresh food, fresh produce, um, packaged food, canned items, and as well as um, unprocessed and uncooked food and dried groceries as well. And New Orleans has a population of about 400,000 people. And there are only 31 full service grocery stores. And unfortunately, those, um, I think, I believe 23 of them, I don't know, we'll get back to the bank, but um, I believe 23 of them full grocery full service grocery stores are located in uptown New Orleans where the um, mostly affluent people live. 
And so this also becomes an issue of transportation for those residing in areas like um, northern cities and the southern floor. They don't have the proper means to get to these grocery stores. And also these grocery stores are expensive. Um, and typically, these low income, the, the people live, residing in these low income areas have to uh, resort to stores like the Dollar Tree and some Walmart. And um, so they don't have access to fresh fruits and vegetables. And in these areas, a bag of chips is cheaper than fresh fruits and vegetables. And so this also leads to the issue of um, public health and obesity. So when you're relying on fast food and stores like um, some dollars, you don't, you're not getting the proper nutrition food. And um, this just leads to a health epidemic. And, um, And so, um, as I mentioned earlier, transporting food is, is an issue. And so one of our, one of the solutions can be um, urban farming. And so New Orleans has about, um, has between 15,000 and 25,000 acres of lots, and which is mainly due to um, Hurricane Katrina and when many residents evacuated. And to this day, they're still vacant. And they remain vacant um, due to the hopes of economic gain um, future business pro prospects, but this has not been the case, nothing has been developed on this land. And so um, utilizing these vacant lots and turning them into um, urban farms is would be greatly benefit the, uh, the population. Uh, this would bring food to them directly instead of having to um, manage their way to the nearest grocery store that they probably can't afford much food there. And so um, these, these urban farms can also serve as multi purpose um, use of the land and serve as a community um, center. So, our class we visited um, recirculating farms in Mid City, and um, there it was, it was a community center really. We were just there, like, um, digging some some dirt and helping plant some of the, the vegetables that they um, And I think it is important to note that when you're, when you have these um, farms, you need to plant food that the community um, likes and will cook. So you cannot use, um, so it has to have a cultural difference. And so I think um, utilizing these vacant um, lots will greatly benefit them. So those are two of the kind of themes that resonated with them. We did a lot of other things. So just to kind of wrap up, um, I mentioned this at the beginning and, and I want to follow up with it. You saw the faces of the three professors who put this on. I can't help that I was born white, but what I can help is what I learned about, expose myself to, and um, and then use my platform as, a, as an academic, a scholar to tell others about it. So introducing our students to people that, um, that have these, um, these issues affected by environmental um, aspects that I study, I think is an important part to bridge this, bring this together and bring awareness to everybody. So um, I put up two quotes from, you know, we, we had them write uh, reflections toward the end. And I just drew out two that I thought were interesting and, and engaging for y'all to read through. Um, it, it was a, uh, I didn't know how it would go because of what I just acknowledged with my whiteness um, and my colleagues too. Um, and we made it work by uh, having the community um, partners that helped us to be introduced to, help our students be introduced to issues in our city. And um, Loyola students love volunteering anyway. I think it's one of the reasons that we attract them to Loyola. Um, and so many of them have continued to volunteer with these organizations. Hillary served as the social media person for recirculating farms um, after doing this course. And we have other examples of internships and things like that that have happened. So um, any ideas, suggestions, feedback that you have for us for uh, taking this to a different level of education, telling others about it, we appreciate um, hearing from you and, and uh, learning from you as well. So thank you for coming to uh, our talk. Thank you for listening to us about one way we're addressing some of these issues. Thank you.